My name's Dave DeBow, founder of MoneyPartnerFormula.com, and this show is built for everyday real estate investors who are actively doing deals and looking to scale using other people's money. So if you're an active real estate investor and you want to get featured on the show to talk about your own real estate and capital raising experiences, then just go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now let's get rolling with this episode and remember to subscribe for daily interview content. All right, guys, welcome to Property Profits Podcast. I'm your host, Bryce Kaminsky, filling in for Dave Dubow. And have you ever wondered how a former Codwell banker, commercially trained underwriter turned real estate investor is navigating the complexities of today's market? Well, today, my guest, Jason Park from Los Angeles, he's here to share his insights on creative property acquisition, capital raising, and filtering out bad leads. Jason, welcome to the show, man. Great to have you here. Oh, thanks for being here, man. Thanks for the invite. And I'm just happy to share uh, some other knowledge that, you know, I was trained at at Cole Banker Commercial and just what I'm doing in the Pace Morby community and just uh, yeah. be able to spend time. You guys are everywhere. Everywhere you turn, there's a guy going like this Pace Morby community. So <laughs> that's exciting because, I mean, the reason that that community is taking off is creative property acquisitions. The interest rate is forcing people to move in different ways. So before we dump, you know, drive into that section really hard, you didn't start there. You started as a commercial banker uh, with Codwell Commercial. Is that where you got your start or were you investing before that? So, you know, I've been investing in property since uh, I would say about 2006. I joined wow. Codwell Banker Commercial um, as a real estate agent back in 2005, I was there for about eight years, but, um, you know, I'm coming from the restaurant world, like, mm -hmm. uh, the Michelin star and uh, farm the table type restaurants also. But while I had my restaurant back in the early two thousands, I would join that brokerage and I did both at the same time. Interesting. So you've been investing since Oh six. How was 2008 then? 2008 was horrible. <laughs> uh, I was overconfident thinking that the correction would not be as big um, for as long. And, and, or yeah, for as long. Right. So if you bought up to about 2013, 2014, right now, you'd be sitting really great. Um, mm. I had purchased a property uh, for myself and it was an acquisition of 710 at the peak. You know, there are houses selling around me for like 1.1, 1.2. Like that was tremendous. Right. But then mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm just going to hold on to it because the crash can't be that big. It can't be that bad. Yeah. And it was bad. And so I also did you end up having to sell that property. No, I lost it because the restaurant world, it was doing horribly um, and I couldn't make the payments. It I did lose it to foreclosure. I was also in a commercial property in Victorville. Mm -hmm. And that went way upside down. I put in a hundred thousand dollars and I got a check like four or five years later for like, I don't know, $8,000 or something like that. Wow. Right. So it was just a horrible mess. And uh, the numbers are not looking good. It's very similar. Some say it's worse than 2008. So I'm just being cautious. I'm holding a lot of cash, but I'm also starting to look into acquiring properties now. Uh, so right now I'm looking into a portfolio purchase uh, in West Virginia, and we're looking at some Arizona and Texas properties, and we're getting ready to buy. Yeah, I mean, th that's the one thing that I think people are, I'm not going to say like uh, underestimating, overestimating, but we're never going to be able to time the bottom of the market. It, it, like, by the time you realize it, the market bounces, it's going to bounce. So right. you kind of have to like get in, like, we know it's not at the top. <laughs> so we know we're not at the top. And, sure. <laughs> yeah, it's not there. And all the signals from the major banks are telling us that there may be a turn coming. Now, right. that that's kind of like a, a, a bit of a gamble. How are you hedging the bet that it doesn't continue, uh, interest rates don't continue? So uh, have you heard of dollar cost averaging or DCA? It's essentially not knowing exactly where the bottom is, but you're expecting mm -hmm. the bottom. But if you hit the bottom, most likely um, it's going to go up. Mm -hmm. So usually when the Fed pivots historically the last four times, uh, when the Fed pivots, they start uh, stopping the raise of the interest rate, they halt, and then they start to pivot down. 
uh, on average, I don't know the exact numbers, but on average, the last four times, 18 months after that, uh, there is some type of a recession, right? Mm -hmm. So in 2008, it was a, a major recession, right? Yeah. Um, so based on that, we're looking at third quarter of 2024. So if we hit the bottom, all the hedge funds will be coming in and they'll be buying and we will be competing with them. And mm -hmm. I don't know about you. I don't have pockets that deep to well, they, compete they, with someone like that. We, we were kind of experiencing the same thing in BC, in uh, Vancouver and the Toronto market where mm -hmm. Uh, there were investors parking as much money as they could into these assets, not even trying to get a deal. They were actually going in the opposite direction and saying how much, like, okay, it's listed for 2 million. Can I pay 3 million and park $3 million into this asset? So when things don't make sense for us, because we're doing mm -hmm. numbers and calculations and being like, oh, this is a deal or not a deal. Right. Um, when the numbers go out the window, and it's just like acquisition, pure acquisition without, without, without kind of a boundary um, that is definitely going to get a lot more competitive. It's happening here in Canada. We just saw a, a major acquisition in the uh, Toronto, Ontario market where mm -hmm. um, a subsidiary of, I think it's BlackRock or one of the hedge funds yep. moved in and acquired a block of, I think it was. I'd be guessing, but it, it it's definitely like something like three point eight billion dollars worth of uh, real estate because we had a we have we're having some investors uh, kind of losing their shirt on these things, and when you're losing your shirt as an investor, who's going to come and bail you out? Well, the people who have more money than they know what to do with the hedge funds, the the institutional buyers. So, right, getting in, yeah, getting in soon. I. The other thing too, and maybe you can comment on this with your perspective is, do you see a future where uh, buying property is not available? I don't want to yeah. get too doom and gloom, but when you look at the direction in which institutional buyers are coming in, we can't compete with that money. Exactly. Um, so I, yeah. I do agree with you, with your thought and your question. Um, so in 2024, we're going to see a correction to the downside. We've already seen a correction, right? Mm -hmm. June of 2022, at least in the US market, if you look at every single property and you track the price that it was evaluated at and you look at the chart, on average, June 2022 was the peak. Yeah. And it's seen, you know, a correction the to the downside. Yeah, right. Okay, so Canada, the US, here. similar markets. Um, the benefit of America is we're able to leverage a little bit more capital yeah. for a purchase of a property than Canada. So yeah. in that sense, we're lucky, but in that sense, it works to a disadvantage or an advantage depending on where you enter the market, right? So on the upside, if you've already acquired a property, as there's higher leverage in the U.S. real estate market, the ability for someone to borrow more money to acquire the same property allows it to accelerate up in value. Mm -hmm. uh, compared to Canada, right? Because the higher the leverage amount, the more you can pay based on the amount of income and the percentage of your monthly um, holding costs or your monthly um, ability to pay that particular mortgage. So in that sense, if you enter early, then on the upside, uh, you're going to see much more um, accumulation of equity. So that's yeah, why, yeah. exactly. And so that's why I think it's better for you to enter before all the hedge funds start to enter. You're going to be paying a higher price. Yeah, maybe you don't like, let's say you're going to get like, uh, I don't know, 100% appreciation on the asset just for, for the round numbers. And you enter at like the 85. So you only capture 85% of the equity, but you, you're not competing with the buying that's happening when it's at 100% bottom. So you exactly. maybe don't get the 15%. But at least you're in the game because I feel like, and like you're saying, um, we might not know where the bottom is. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that possibly there may be a few institutional employees monitoring it on a daily basis, making sure. And perhaps, you know, perhaps there's a, a bit of like insider trading where they actually do know um where things are going and we're a little bit in the dark. So I like your plan to buy a little bit below, buy when it feels right. Um, 
you know, everything over 10 years makes sense. So exactly. I saw this reel. It said buying, is it a good time to buy? And he, and the guy says, that's the wrong question. He says, is it a good time to own? And he says, it's always a good time to own property over time, long-term investments. Uh, in 1978, a property here in my market of Winnipeg was $42,000. Mm -hmm. And today that property is $420,000. So, um, yeah, 30, 40 years, but I'm sure it cash flowed all the way through and, you know, paying off a $42,000 mortgage in 1978 was a lot easier than it is to pay a $400,000 mortgage today. So let's get right. into the next step here. Let's talk about the creative property acquisitions that, that you're planning to do or are doing already. Yeah. Yeah. So um, right now I'm training two wholesaling teams, right? So that's the acquisitions acquisition side of um, the whole real estate process. Um, you, you know, the traditional route is you're owning a property. So you're the seller, you mm -hmm. hire an agent to represent you and the agent puts it on the MLS or the market. And then you get like Redfin and Zillow. They're the consolidators of information. Yeah. And so you have um, a lot more, I guess, eyes on the property. So in that process, you know, there's always an agent involved. Um, typically in an SFR, it's 2.5% for the seller uh, selling agent. And then also 2.5% for the listing agent. That's 5% already. Mm -hmm. So how about if I'm no longer, so I am no longer an agent. I let my DRE license lapse. I didn't re renew it. And the reason for that is I was paying 30% desk costs just to have my license sitting on the wall at Cola Banker Commercial. Yeah, so with just that for your MLS access and just to get into the computer and in the reality in the United States is you don't really need that access. It's pretty much wide open. Um, maybe not a hundred percent, but Zillow has really changed the game and access to comps and stats and, um, you know, especially, and this is one thing, and maybe you can and chime in on this when you're an investor, um, there's, you're bonded to you're bonded to represent buyers and sellers in a different way. Like I, as an investor, I can just go and buy property and whatever I think and whatever I write and whatever we can negotiate fair game. But if I held right. a license now I'm, you know, I have to ethically, uh, not ethically, but there's like, why is it so cheap? Mr. Agent, you, you, you know, like I have to explain myself and, I have to call to my broker and I have to do disclosures and things like that when I'm purchasing. So do you find that now that you've let the license lapse that it's a little bit more open or did you find an advantage with the license? For me, I found it to be a disadvantage because, you know, when I, back in 2005, there were not big consolidators that were accurate with the information. So I'm pulling stuff off of, you know, CoStar, which is what the commercial side uses and then, you know, the residential uses MLS, right? Mm -hmm. So I have access to those currently still because people on my team are active agents. But back in 2005, we didn't have something as big and powerful as Redfin and Zillow. Mm -hmm. And then there's Realtor.com and all that too. Yeah. So without that lack of information, you're kind of forced to work through an agent to do comps, right? Yeah. So then currently now... The comps you see on Redfin and Zillow, yeah, there's some manipulation from their end. But if you look at just the maps of what your neighbor's uh, house values are, mm -hmm. it's a pretty good way to get a comparable. But before, you're always looking through what your agent provided as a CMA uh, through the MLS. Yeah. But times have very much changed. I don't think there's much value for us as agents um, or me as a former agent to be charging that two and a half percent. So here's an example of a property that, that I listed. Um, it's a net listing at $1.9 million, a net meaning that the seller wants $1.9 million after our commissions and whatever costs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this particular property, any, anyone can click on the link on Zillow or Redfin, and it's going to calculate, hey, this property is worth this much. And then if you spend about 15, 20 minutes, you can see, hey, the the values of properties in the area are this much. So you as a buyer, completely educated, not completely, but very much more educated than someone back in the early 2000s. Yeah. So dealing with that, um, having the license to me doesn't make sense. And this is why as a result, 
the end result is that if I have my license, I have to negotiate a lower margin mm -hmm. and I have to ask permission with my broker, right? Mm -hmm. The broker is also making 30% you know, of each dollar. Mm -hmm. And so the margin of which I can negotiate with the seller that $2 million property or $1.9 million property, it's like 50,000 of, of a commission that I need to take because I'm required by my broker. Mm -hmm. The listing agent and the selling agent, they're both taking $50,000 each. That's $100,000 gone off the table, just like that. Mm -hmm. Now imagine if I didn't have to take that $50,000 commission and I can just take $10,000 to write up the contracts or to read through the contracts or represent the buyer or the seller and all that. And I've done many, many, many of those things. Mm -hmm. Then now all of a sudden it's a better deal for the buyer. And then I can give more money to the seller. So instead of giving the seller $1.9 million, I can say, Hey, I negotiated something great. I can still save um, the client who's the buyer $40,000 and I can take $10,000. And now the buyer is super interested. Or how about I save the buyer $30,000, I take $10,000, and then I give $10,000 more to the seller or anything like that. Now I have that flexibility, right? And I can move quickly because I am the one representing myself instead of asking permission to the broker, hey, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we do this? So well, the, the transactions that is, we do are fast. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing you can do too is um, in the creative financing of things, I feel like and maybe it's an oversimplification, but a lot of real estate agents aren't trained on the creative financing side. Exactly. Of they want to offer to purchase that has financing and they want a standard, you know, clean cut, preferably no conditions. But when you look at where we're at with it rates and et cetera, how are you navigating that with um, the creative property acquisitions? So create, okay. So, just like you said, the standard process is there's a 20% down payment, an institutional lender or a bank brings in 80%, right? Yeah. If you're under 20%, you got PMI and all those things. So, you know, that everyone knows about this stuff. My father's been an agent for decades. This is how he makes money. And he's yeah. done this a lot. But as properties have been uh, flipped upside down, right? So let's say you have a VA, uh, so a veteran gets a 0% down mortgage. He bought it in 2020, 2021. 2022, you know, a couple of years ago. Exactly. And he's got a five-year, so, he might have a five-year term. And so, so he, he has, can actually get a, sorry, go ahead. I'm going to so he has that thing. <laughs> it could be a 30-year term. It could be a shorter term. It, that's up to the, you know, purchase, right? Whatever yeah. the um, now seller, uh, whatever he used to purchase. And those are the terms that are separate from this. But now he's upside down because if he gets an appraisal, he bought the house at $2 million, but it's only appraising for $1.85. Yeah. So he put 0% down. So the mortgage he has in place is $1.85. Mm -hmm. And then it's only worth $1.9. So at $1.9, he has the listing agent and the selling agent, about $90,000. He's writing $40,000 to the bank when he sells his house or he has to do a short sale, right? Yeah. And short sale is not that good of a look either. Um, so that's where a lot of people are. So what we do is there's value in the lower interest rate, right? So yeah. currently we're sitting at for a non jumbo about low sixes for a jumbo. We're looking at seven something. What's that? What are you saying as a jumbo? What is that? Jumbo. I think the cutoff is like eight hundred thousand dollars or something like that. Oh, so, so then like at an that expensive property, a jumbo, right. big, big mortgage. Right. So in Los Angeles, There's it's lots. really hard to find anything under eight hundred or a million, right? Yeah. So for for sure. A, for sure. Yeah, for three two, you're looking at starting eight hundred, but it, a three two can really be up to one point five. So well, you're really looking at it in the dirt, right? It's the dirt, and then there's a there's bricks and sticks on top for like maybe two hundred fifty thousand, and you're paying like seven hundred thousand dollars for the dirt that the house sits on. Exactly. So, creative financing, especially in those in those positions, it's almost like it's not we buy houses; it's we buy mortgages now because we're going to go the in note. there and buy the note, service the debt, help the person out, um, and they actually can get out of a twisted situation 
maybe get a piece of the action inside of the cash flow um, or whatever the you're paying over their mortgage debt. Maybe you're paying them a couple hundred bucks a month over what, because uh, you're looking at yours and you'd be like, and that's the thing that people got to look at when creative financing is that it's not that you can't go raise some money and go to the bank and get a conventional mortgage. It's that it doesn't make sense to do that right now because the conventional mortgage, what's the rate today? Seven, seven and a quarter, 8%. On one point eight million dollars, like eight hundred fifty thousand at eight percent, not exciting. But three percent, that's exciting, and they might even have that because rates did climb that quickly. Yes, so that's exactly the case. So what we do is we're negotiating with the seller of the property. Like, look, I know you want two million dollars for your house, but the appraisals coming back are not at two million. It's like one point nine. Mm -hmm. right? But what value there is that you currently own and possess and control is your mortgage. Right? Your mortgage is at three and a half percent interest rate. If I were to buy your house right now at $2 million, I'm looking at a 7.25 interest rate. So mm -hmm. if you do the math, my monthly holding cost is now $800 more per month or something like that in order to own the same house. Well, how about I pay you your asking price of $2 million? but I take over your mortgage subject to the existing mortgage. I have power of attorney just on that mortgage so that I can have conversations with the bank. Mm -hmm. And in that, I can pay you that $2 million instead of trying to get a cash offer at 1.9. Because you're mm -hmm. not, you don't like that 1.9 number. You want that 2 million. Well, I like the lower monthly interest rate and the lower monthly payment. So if I can make you happy with the purchase price of $2 million, and then you can make me happy with the same cost monthly as paying $1.85 for your house. Mm -hmm. right? So both parties are happy. But what I teach and what Pace Morby teaches is that make the seller happy. Like what are the issues that the seller is dealing with? How can we help this person so that they have less pain in dealing with us, in having a relationship with us? And then mm -hmm. if the seller is happy, then what we do is on our side, we try to structure it so that there's terms that makes us happy. And mm -hmm. so both sides win, but this is not something that works for all of the properties. So you can't no. force creative financing on something, but it is a very good possibility in this type of market. And the reason why I embrace it so much is on the commercial side, 75% of the deals coming through that brokerage had some type of creative financing. Residential yeah, real estate prevalent. agents and, don't understand, but yeah, the commercial, commercial agents, we big, completely yeah. get it. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that many commercial deals that don't have vendor take backs that don't have mm -hmm. terms. Like that's like the whole game on the commercial exactly. side. Like, mm -hmm. No one's buying these things straight up. And the reality is the people who control them now, they didn't even buy them straight up. They got to vendor take back or a note or a forgiveness or something when they bought it in 78 or 85 right. and they've been running this business or this commercial strip or this apartment block. And now they recognize that the, that's how people get in and that's how they got in and they're very open to it. And commercial agents are much more open to it. So do you find it? Cause that's the thing is like on the residential side, it's a, forgotten art i would say it's been 30 years since people have really been talking about it since the last time in the 80s when you had to do stuff about it in 2008 that was it was just too far gone like it, it went too right. fast it went too far gone it wasn't something that people could salvage a lot it was like foreclosure game mm -hmm. so in that there's like filtering out leads and things like that but let's talk about capital how are you funding these deals how much capital are you bringing to these deals? Um, are you having to raise capital for these acquisitions? So there's two parts of the question you just asked. Mm -hmm. If we're able to negotiate, so going from the acquisition side and bringing it to an end buyer, we are creating interest rates, not interest, we're creating situations where the entry fee is 10% mm -hmm. or less. There's a yeah. property that we wanted to you know, uh, bring to a friend of ours so the entry fee was 4% of the acquisition price, right? And right. it's subject to the existing mortgage. And it was a low equity situation. So all they're doing is bringing in $10,000 to give to the seller and then carrying on the mortgage uh, payments. The seller right? like there's moves. 
Right, exactly. Seller moves out of the house. Our friend uh, lives in the house. He takes over the mortgage. The grant deed goes into our friend's name. And the entry fee was uh, about $28,000 and the purchase price was eight hundred fifty. dollars right? Mm -hmm. it, tremendous, right? Um, so that's a SFR, but there's a lot of investment properties that are non that uh, homesteaders that is you're buying it for ac acquisition for uh, investment, whether you're going to rent it out as a midterm rental or you're going to do a co-living opportunity like with a pad split or things like that. In that case, I've moved personally about $3.6 million in the past six months, Mm. Nice. right? So raising the gap funding or the EMD for these particular investment properties. Now, in order to do that, you have to make sure there's enough room in the property as far as equity is concerned so that it covers the first position and the second position. And there's about 20 to 30% left of equity after mm. the ARV, right? And in that case, that's the kind of capital that I raise for. So um, like a lot of the commercial ones and a lot of luxury flips. So another one in Orange County that I raised for is $4.2 million acquisition cost, right? Mm -hmm. EMD was $126,000, right? We're looking at, I think it was $1.7 or $1.8 million for uh, the down payment or the gap. And then, you know, the rest of the institutional lender was coming in and it was about $400,000 of um, scope of work. And then the comps in the area are showing between 5.25 to $5.7 million, right? This is mm -hmm. in Ladera Ranch. It's like at the top of the mountain. So you have no neighbors where you're looking into um, their windows or any structure. Yeah. And there's only five other houses on that particular peak of the mountain. And, and all you see is sky and tops of trees. Right. So there's safety in that. Right. There's mm -hmm. security in that. And you're part of the LLC. You become a member of the LLC. So you're part of the ownership of the property. And also there is a deed of trust and deed in lieu on top of that. Right. So it's very secure if you know what to ask for and if you know um, who to connect with. Right. This is a developer that does. He has currently eight different fix and flips going on. That's why he ran out of capital. And that's why mm -hmm. we raised for him. And we're very secure in that. So what's one of the strategies you're using right now to access um, new funding for your deals, like reaching out, networking? What What's your strategy to increase? Because the thing, you know, the thing with capital is once it's deployed, it's usually locked in for some amount of time. And if you're doing that sort of velocity, you're going to have to go back, get more ingredients to make more cake. So exactly. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Right, yeah. What are you doing right now to get? more capital get more people interested in what it is you guys are out there doing so the recipe like you mentioned you know is the developer and the property and then the ingredients that we're missing one of the ingredients is the capital mm -hmm. so it takes a lot of handshaking and sharing what you're doing and and hugging people right so uh, i do meet up with a lot of people face to face so i'm active in orange county and then the ventura county thousand oaks area and i'm act actively involved in san diego as well and we're just talking about we just talk about what we do right mm -hmm. so bryce you talked about what i did what you do and i talk about what i do and if someone's interested they're interested you yeah. know and essentially we're looking at like 15 20 percent returns in three or four months mm -hmm. right so you do the math on that that's like what uh uh, 60 to like 80 90 percent apr yeah if you right? can if you can keep the money invested and in, and circulating in deals so um are you raising money from existing contacts or are you growing your network getting new money into your deals there's very there's a small portion that's new so mm -hmm. then i have to walk them through the whole process like do you even understand what gap funding is Right. Yeah. Gap like funding, how, how can certain people who want to do gap funding because it would you say gap funding is more risky than some sort of flip funding where it's like six, eight months a year? That's a difficult one, right? So I, I someone told me this yesterday, and they said when you underwrite for a gap fund, or if you underwrite for construction, or if you underwrite for EMD, or you underwrite for a development. It's all different. You have to have a different perspective. Yes and no. 
we don't have unlimited time to do a completely thorough, objective underwriting process. Mm -hmm. I actually do that. So if I hand someone my underwriting and they're the borrower or what, or they're the lender, the underwriting is complete and it's impartial, mm -hmm. right? It's objective, not subjective. On the comments, I have some uh, subjective opinions on where this particular zip code is going, where the gentrification process is. Is it two blocks away that the last um, block was gentrified? Mm -hmm. Are we seeing it pushing out to your particular block? That's an opinion based on what facts are there. So it, true that some type of um, subjective numbers and opinions are in an underwriting piece, but it should not be like that. If it's thorough, it has numbers for both the borrower and the lender. Mm -hmm. um, and then well, after that, that funding is quite profitable if you're the lender because it is quick. And exactly. so maybe it doesn't go perfect all the time, but one probably wipes out a bad one. Like one good one probably wipes out a bad one. And so if you do two for every like five, let's say, let's say in like five that four of them are complete and one of them like goes a little sideways, you're probably still way ahead on that on gap funding. You are way ahead. And this is what I tell the uh, new, newer PMLs. In general, statistically speaking, in our community, 10% of your deals will go bad or sideways. Okay, so nine nine out of 10 deals, you're making like decent profit. You're making 60 to 90% APR. So let's say you have a deal that goes bad or sideways. Guess what? You have a deed of trust and a deed in lieu, like deed in lieu of foreclosure. You make a lot of money as a, getting returns at 60 to 90%. So in a year, you need a tax write-off or you need something with depreciation. Mm -hmm. So if you acquire that property, because it's going sideways, now you have a property that you can depreciate, right? Mm -hmm. Most likely you're gonna be a professional in the real estate business because you're meeting all those requirements for the IRS. So then now you can do a cost aggregation study and then you can get some tax write-offs, mm -hmm. right? So anyway, we need that. Or are you going to buy a car at the end of the year so that you're paying less in taxes? So in either case, you have a deal that goes sideways. You have depreciation, so it's going to offset any of the taxes that you have. So mm -hmm. what's wrong with having something go sideways and you don't pay taxes on it? You own the property. You're going to hold it. You're going to pay the monthly carrying costs until the economy recovers or you fix, you finish the fix and flip Just any turnover of profit, yeah, right? I mean exit it hopefully a profit maybe you just get out of it you know sometimes it, getting it off your plate is is important too so right fire sale yeah right? that's why you need to have the 20 to 30 percent after your position on the property then if you do a fire sale and you give it 20 percent off you still walk away with all your money so right? are, are that's you, what um, underwriting is about yeah and uh, certainly making sure that um and that's the thing too is that Lenders didn't become lenders because they don't know what they're doing. They became lenders because they know how to do their own underwriting. They have a gut feeling about profit and they trust proper underwriting because they know when things are sideways. So one thing I always say is like, if, if you're getting lender hesitation on your deal, it's probably not a deal because they know better than you. That's how they got hundreds of millions of dollars. And you right. want some of it, like you should listen to your lenders when they're, when they're resistant to your deal, probably because right. it's not a deal. So on that exactly. note, are you a find the deal and then the money person, or do you prefer to have your capital lined up and then go looking for deals? I think simultaneous is the most important, right? So you should be actively meeting new people or spending time in a community that's actively doing deals. Yeah. And then you let people know, this is what I'm providing for, for myself. I'm actively meeting developers. I have different people on my team that are meeting developers and then they create the relationship and then they bring me in when they are qualifying themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So if a developer is doing a lot of work, they have a lot of capital deployed, I'm happy to bring in that additional capital so they can fix and flip 10 more houses. So instead of only doing 30 in a year, they do 40 or 50 in a year. I'm happy to be that partner to bring in the capital. And then also I'm happy to connect people that have you know, funds to deploy and introduce them to the developer. And I do all the underwriting. I make sure all the contracts are there. 
And I make sure and I follow through to make sure that the capital partners or the PMLs are paid out, mm -hmm. right? And we build in late fees so that if they're not paid out, that they're receiving more return on their funds. Because for if it's stuck patient. for two additional months, like that doesn't make sense, right? Yeah, so I mean, opportunity cost. Exactly, right? Deployed somewhere else, right? There, there's the velocity of money. If it's stuck, it's not moving forward. It's not making money on your money. And that's really important to do. So it's a simultaneous thing. At first, I think more people are like, hey, I want to connect with um, people with money. But then mm -hmm. what developers or what properties are you um, having monies to deploy in? If you yeah, can do definitely. it simultaneously, then I think that's the best case scenario. So typically when people are investing um, large amounts of capital, you know, they're investing whatever for the initiation fees or whatever it might be, they typically need to like, know, and trust you. So what are some things that you're doing to kind of build that like, no trust relationship with your money partners, with your um, social media and things of that nature? How are you building that like, no trust so that it's easier for people to invest with you? At first, you know, I didn't have a reputation. Like in Southern California, I think most people know me as the underwriter. And then as, you know, time progresses, it, my reputation is going outside of Southern California. But for me, the way I started is, these are the numbers. I don't care whether you like me, I don't care whether you like the developer, it, it doesn't matter. The numbers work. And with all the numbers that I saw, this is hitting the top one or 2% of the opportunities there. So everything else is a lead until it's underwritten and we know the security and the amount of equity available on that property. Mm -hmm. So if, if the price is, again, going back to that $2 million house, if it's worth $2 million on the market, he has a loan payoff amount of 700,000 and you're coming in for 400,000 to do the rehab and flip it at 2 million, now you have half a million dollars just sitting there in the cap, the gains, right? Mm -hmm. So if there's a fire sale, if it's worth $2 million, you can fire sale it at $1.8 million. There's still $300,000 left after your half million dollars of capital injection or capital partnership. That is what a deal is. And that's what a lot of the deals look like that I am going to green light. And when people started to see that and they started to get the returns and no one lost their money, then, okay, the reputation started. So I started off with numbers. Um, I am not a person that likes to meet lots of people. I'm not into a quantity type person, mm -hmm. but there are those that are on my team that like to meet a lot of people so they can deal with the quantity. And then as they spend more hours with this person, they go, okay, this person is a good fit. And no, this person, they don't even know what gap funding is and they're not willing to learn about it. And yeah. so it doesn't work. Or like EMD, all that there's different criterion that you need mm -hmm. to have in place, but they're not willing to know what an EMD is. So then they're just conventional investors. Go ahead, put 20% down and then buy a property and then do the yeah, burma. It's not in the, the right mindset for what you're trying to do. So just say, yes. okay. We'll do something if we can, but I'm looking for this. And that's really important. I think that people um, just start thinking like, I'm going to raise money. And it's like, for what? Like you're saying, like for what? Exactly. How? What's the rates? What's How are you going to use it? You know, like, and why would they lend to you? And it, and it can get really, you know, like, I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, my friend has this saying, it's like a lot of people think about what they want but they spend maybe 10% of their time thinking about what they don't want. And when you can, when you figure out what you don't want, you're going to have a much more refined third stage, which is like, I want all this stuff. And, I, and then I take away the stuff I don't want. And then really the third stage is like, okay, I have my vision of both what I do want and what I don't. And now I can make educated decisions about the path forward. Cause everything's exciting in the first stage. I want this. I want a Lamborghini. I want, well, I don't really want a Lamborghini because it's, <laughs> you know, a two seater and, you know, maybe you're a really tall person and it's just not a fit, but that first stage of dreaming can get really exciting, but it's when you really file it down and you get into the most, the, the more defined vision, that's when you're able to really execute it. Cause when you want everything, anything will do. 
And so if, if you're specific, you're going to get what you're looking for. So, you know, with you knowing more or less what it is that you're looking for, how do people connect with you, find out more and really, you know, participate in your business? What should they do? How do they find you? Well, in the Southern California community, there's a lot of meetups. I am part of the Pace Morby community. There's um, the Capital side, which are caters. I'm one of the gator mm-hmm. elites. Awesome. Um, we're very yeah. active in the um, particular Why do they call Zoom it gator? Is gator it because we're taking a big <laughs> chunk, right? If you get bit by a gator. And you're just um, waiting it's... around with your butt mouth open and then deal comes along. Pfft. Exactly. So we take, you know, I thought so, yeah. we wait for big deals. Right. We make for a, a situation where I say this, if you're wanting to deal with an emergency, we're the ones. Right? Yeah. Right? And that if seems to, to be the where they're coming department. through, like the the really creative financing department. That's the Gators. Right. So, uh, is so there like an Instagram or like a Facebook or a phone number that people can reach out direct that one way that you want to get hit up? So the primary way is my email address, right? So it's Jason P at mightybasesolutions.com. And that's at the bottom. But on yeah. Instagram, if you want to give me a DM, it's Jason P dot REI. So real estate investments. Um, and you can reach out that way. And, you know, let's have a conversation and let's see how I can provide value for you. And if there's any pains that you have, maybe I have a solution to resolve some of your pain. And I think that's the perspective that we have. Uh, yeah, let's wanna, try to make sure that you win finder. first. Yeah, you exactly. want to be a solution finder. And I think that's really where businesses blow up is when they stop um, asking the market for what they want and start asking the market for what they want. You know, like instead of you going out there trying to get what you you want, you have more conversations about what other people need. And if you help enough people, I think the saying goes, if you help enough people get what they want, you'll get what you want. So exactly. uh, I love that idea. So Jason, I really appreciate you stopping by and, and sharing. We could probably go. We could probably go an hour on this, but uh, we could probably go at least another hour. There's so yeah, much. I think I think it's easier for people to reach out and you know connect with you out there in the Los Angeles area. So I really appreciate you stopping by, Jason. Yeah, thank you so much, and I had a great time, and we'll talk again soon. Yeah, no problem. Until next time, guys. We'll catch you on the next episode. Your property profits. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you want to listen to more daily interview content, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an active real estate investor and you're doing deals and you'd like to get featured on this show, then just head over to daveinterviewsyou.com. Now at moneypartnerformula.com, we help real estate investors to create a process for predictably getting capital so they can do more deals without relying on hard money lenders or the banks. We do this by building them a private capital marketing system. Now, if you want help turning yourself into a big money capital attraction machine, then book a call with our team to see how we can help. Just visit moneypartnerformula.com to find out more. All right, take care and we'll see you on the next interview.